Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from a sweltering London. Myself, uh, suburban gooner Chris, Amanda and uh, Charles Watts are probably all dying a little bit because the southeast is bloody hot at the moment. But thank you to everyone for joining us for this extra special, same old Arsenal, uh, international break. Uh, quick check-in that we're going to do. And... Because there's no football at the moment, not proper football anyway, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't bother watching England. I don't bother watching the internationals because they just drive me nuts. But um, uh, hopefully um, we can entertain you for the next 45 minutes or so, because, yeah, we've got uh, Charles on. And uh, if uh, some of you who are regulars will have seen uh, the summer series that we did, one in, one out, one bangs, Charles is very kind enough to, uh, to join me uh, to talk about his uh, predictions for the upcoming season. And at the time, I had uh, Mr. Seeger on as well. Uh, we talked about two sets of books, but this is a, a book focus uh, today. So we're going to talk to Charles about his uh, his wonderful book that he's just released. I should probably actually introduce those guys rather than just going into a five minute monologue, though. Uh, Charles, thanks for joining us. Oh, no worries. Looking forward to the next 45 minutes or so. Like you said, get sort of dust off the cobwebs after a week of non-club football. It is a bit it's a bit dull, isn't it? After a month, you just get into the season and bang, internationals hit. It's like, oh. it, it drives you nuts. Like, why can't they leave it to like an October type thing so that we can actually get a little bit of cadence around the Premier League and then they turn it into this kind of, we've given you a little taster and then we're going to take that away for a week. It just, it's annoying, isn't it? I know, especially after the win against United, he's wanted to carry on after that didn't you just next game please and not have to t wait two weeks for the next one exactly exactly so um i can't it would be remiss of me uh not introducing um the other uh same old arsenal uh podder regular uh host but she's decided she doesn't want to host today she just wants to uh just jump in and ask questions and things like that but amanda you're right I am. I can even see the shine off my face. I am yeah. so hot. I've even got pigtails tonight because I can't have my hair down too much. But yes, no, looking forward to it. Looking forward to speaking to Charles. I love all of your tweets, Charles. And I am very much looking forward to discussing your book, which you're just about to show everybody. This is why we're chatting with you. Revolution, yes. the rise there of our tech arsenal. Um, I mean, I'm going to leave it to Chris to host. And what we're going to do, people in the chat room, we've only got Charles to about five past ten past eight. If you've got any questions, I'm going to get them in as quick as possible. Obviously, not only about his book, anything else that you've ever wanted to ask. Mr. Charles Watts, here's your go. Lovely. Um, so um, we, let's start off by the book, because we'll probably then we'll get onto other bits. Like I'm quite interested in getting your views, Charles, on the Nico Pepe stuff. I think we sort of touched on it earlier in the summer. Um, and then also um, I thought uh, Fabrizio Romano's uh, had an interesting sort of message that's gone out today about how much Erdegaard loves the club and all of that sort of stuff. But we'll get to that. But let's focus on the book first. And again, earlier in the summer, we talked about it a little bit, but it wasn't quite out then. So just for those people who may not have... Um, tuned in for that time can you just tell us a little bit about inspiration behind why you decided to why write a book specifically about Mikel Arteta because I guess technically he's quite still early into his reign isn't he it is it's not I, I mean it's not specifically about Mikel he's obviously the center point of it but it's kind of about the rise of Arsenal during that time and obviously like I said he's a central figure because without him Arsenal wouldn't be where they are now and he's um but it's just been such a a brilliant journey, I think, the last four years. There's been so much happening from the highs, the lows, the really difficult times and sort of dragging the club through that and taking it to where they are now, obviously, from eighth to fifth, from fifth to second. I'm so close last year and the wild journey that we were all on. And so it focuses all around that. It focuses about the the sort of reconnection at Arsenal as well, I think, over the last, the period that Mikel's been in. Um, been in charge, you know, I think that's really central to it as well. And so I speak to people at Red Action and, and stuff like that, just to, to sort of chart how, you know, Arsenal, before Mikel arrived, it was a pretty miserable place, let's face it, wasn't it? It wasn't fun. It was, no. we, all, we all went because it was Arsenal. So we kind of felt like we had to go, but it, it wasn't the best place to watch football. It was fractious. It was divisive. And it needed someone to come in to basically pick the club up by the scruff of the neck and say, right, cut all that out. We're going this way in this direction and we're going to sort things out. And he's done that. And obviously last season was amazing. It was so fun. It was brilliant to be at the Arsenal again, watching just that, the atmosphere at the ground, the connection between the players, the fans, everyone. And so it's all about that. It's just documenting the journey 
um, through. And it, but it is Mikel's obviously central to that. It starts off talking a lot about his time as a player, how he retired at the club, you know, getting insight into what he was like as a captain, as a teammate at Arsenal, and going off to Manchester City, learning his trade under Pep. And I think he's such an interesting character as well. You know, he's got such a his personality is just so focused. He's so driven. He's so determined to win. And that comes through and all of his character. And um, I just think he's a really interesting guy from, you know, sitting, watching him, talking to him for four years and being there throughout the journey, you know, as a member of the press sort of documenting it all. It was just a, it's just been a wild ride, I think. And it's, and I try to capture all that in the book. Nice. Nice. Uh, what we'll do, Amanda, I'll tell you what, let's alternate on the questions because otherwise yeah. I'm just going to keep asking Charles questions. So I'm yeah, going to uh, jump things. in first. I'm going to jump in first because you just talked about that reconnection. So obviously you're an Arsenal fan, but you're also a journalist and you've been mm-hmm. in those press conferences and stuff like that. Um, how quickly did you see, I guess, from interacting with him in those kind of press conferences and stuff, how quickly did you see that kind of reconnection happening? Was that something that almost instantly, you know, I, I mean, I remember, we probably all vividly remember that first sort of um, uh, interview or that press conference that he did just as he arrived when he talked about like, oh, we need to bring back almost the soul back to this club. There needs to be like, we need to be together a little bit more. And at the time, it's like, yes, he's saying the right things. He's an ex-Arsenal player. But in my head, I was almost a bit like, that feels a little bit easier said than done. So how, I'm really interested to get your view. How quickly did that reconnection, do you think, happen? It didn't happen quickly. And it, it definitely wasn't easy. It definitely was easier said than done. And, you know, I, I, there's times, and this is all, all in the book, you know, how it was really difficult at times. And he could have easily gone at times. You know, the club were patient with him there was at least a couple of occasions where I don't think he could have any complaints if the club were like this isn't working we're we're going to move on specifically that I don't really the the start of the where we we finished fifth the start of that season obviously those three straight defeats and Arsenal went into the international break at this point bottom of the table without a point without a goal I don't really look at that as rock bottom but he could have gone at that point but obviously I think more the season before that that run up to Christmas when Arsenal were 15th and you know, only a few points above relegation at Boxing Day. And, you know, it was really difficult. They couldn't score a goal. They could barely create a chance. They couldn't win a game for about sort of 10, 11 games. And so it it wasn't immediate by any means. But I think those first two years were so important in terms of getting to where they are now, because those were the years where he sort of looked at the club. They took all these decisions. They decided the way they were going to want to go. They made some really big decisions. They got big players out. They sort of did all the hard work then. And that set the groundwork for what we've seen in the last two seasons. And I think that real connection didn't really start until after those three straight defeats at the start of the season, they finished fifth. And it came back after the international break. You know, Tommy Asu had been signed, Ramsdale had been had been signed and got it went into the t- team in that game against Norwich, I think it was, after the international break. And they finished that match against Norwich with all six summer signings on the pitch. And I, I feel that was the point where it all started. That was when it felt for the first time like Mikel's team, all those two years of hard work previously in trying to get rid of other managers' players to start building his own team. It all started then. And then, of course, they went to Burnley 1-1-0 and then it was the Tottenham game, that 3-1 when Arsenal for 45 minutes blew them away and Saka, Smith-Rowe. And, and it just felt like inside the stadium that day, you could feel it was different. It was a new team. It was Mikel's team. And that was when, for me, the connection really started. And from then on, you know, it's just the trajectory has just been that, that. There's been bumps in the road, obviously. There's been disappointing finishes in both seasons, but you can just see the way things are charting. And so, yeah, it wasn't immediate by any means. It was difficult. And that all comes across in the book. You know, it's not mm. been all plain sailing by any means. But, yeah, I feel like the connection sort of started then and has just grown ever since. Yeah, 100%. So, talking about the connection, I, I fully agree. But I tell you where else it started as well with the away games with the away fans. Mm-hmm. I think it was... It, you know, we've always had good... Look, most clubs' away fans are better than the home fans. They're, I've always noticed that. However, what I noticed was when I was watching game after game and away, the support that the, the away fans, our fans were giving this team was was nothing like I'd ever seen before. Not for many, many years, Charles. I mean, going back many years, say even 20 years, that, you know, we'd go 1-0 down. They were clapping our players back to the penalty... Um, halfway line they were they were behind them and I think when you breed love and support people you know you know 
grow on that. And they felt they wanted to do well for those fans in that stadium. Now, I remember Stuart McFarlane, the photographer, taking a picture, I think, I don't know where it was, Aston Villa, somewhere. And I'm thinking, this is it. This is where the connection is all beginning. There's all different parts to it. And I agree with getting rid of the players and having his own team. I, I sort of get that. But I've, I am so in awe of what our away fans did constantly every game whether we won you know lost or drew they were supporting them and then that fed back to the emirates because all of a sudden and as much as i can't stand the drum i love the ashburton army for what they've done i love them it doesn't matter that i don't want the drum drives me mad what they've done down the clock ends that's matching the north bank I sit in the East Stand Upper, we're all up singing. you got the West Stand singing as well. And all of a sudden, people are realising that support and support is what is bringing us all together. Wow. You know, of course you can moan about players, Charles. You know, we pay our money, you know, we go out the stadium and we moan. But I think people realise that support is far more important than, you know, the issues. And I remember the days of Wenger as well. You know, I was very late to wanting him to go um, but the time was up and for me he should have gone after Hull when we beat them in the FA Cup I wanted him to go on a high one of the most uh, you know incredible manager for us um, but it's taken time to get where we are but Rome's not built in a day so you have to stick with a manager that has got no points and is in the bottom three because for me I, I've said since day one I felt he was right for our club yeah, well, that first press conference when he walked in, I was there at the Emirates when he walked in, was an appointed. And he said straight away, we're not going to get anywhere if we don't have the fans on our side. And he was so determined yeah. to bring that back because he'd been there three days before sitting on the bench next to Guardiola when City steamrolled at Arsenal 3-0 in a half-empty Emirates. And it was just such a miserable night. I'll never forget that night. It was so miserable. Where, um, And he, he was stunned by it. He couldn't believe it because obviously he'd been there as a player and experienced when... You know, obviously, we didn't win a title, but it was some good moments at the Emirates when the fans were there and on side. And he could feel the things had completely broken down by that point. And he knew if he was going to get anywhere in this project that he wanted to build, he had to get those fans back on the side. And so it's been so central to everything he's done. And I think a big part of that is the players that he's brought in as well and this team that he's built. They're also likable. I mean, it's been a long, long time. And me going back as a fan, you know, I, I think the only time at the Emirates where I had anything like close to as fun as last season or the season before was the 07-08 season when you had Sesk and uh, Hleb and Rizikian yes, right. and that, that team yeah. when, when Arsenal should have won the title that season as well yeah. and then obviously Eduardo mm. broke his leg but it was that similar sort of everyone bought into it it was a likeable team and everyone bought into it and you have to go all the way back to Highbury if there was to find that again and I think he knew that he absolutely knew that the fans had to come on board if he was going to have any success. And you could sort of chart that. And I know what you're talking about, the away fans. I remember, do you remember the game at Leicester when Aaron Ramsdale made that unbelievable save? From yeah. Matt yeah. It was at the start of that season when Arsenal had just got on form again, when the, the new team had sort of emerged. And the away fans that day were absolutely brilliant. You had the Sacker and Smith Rowe song ringing out for the, like one of the first times. And you could just feel it, the energy. There was It was Arsenal were energised again. It was a new, young, vibrant team that the fans could buy into. And that you know, it just continued from then on. And then, like you said, the Aston Villa game when the Mikel Arteta chant was born for the first time, really, after the 1-0 win at Villa Park. So many great moments in in, in sort of run to where we are now. But also, yeah. Charles, support breeds confidence. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, if you're in your job and your, your director or your manager says to you, do you know, well done. It means sometimes more that they've appreciated that than a pay rise. Yeah. You know, in respect. And I think what, what Arteta did right, he never once criticised the fans. He actually said they have every right to criticise us if we don't perform. So he was completely on board with what he needed to do. And that's why I believed that he was the right man for us. He got us. You know the way like Jurgen Klopp got Liverpool? He got us exactly completely right. It was new. We needed to build from the bottom. He never once criticised us, you know, and there was a lot. I think one of the worst nights I remember being an Arsenal fan was watching Bellerin go into the crowd at Crystal Palace, what, about seven, eight, nine years ago? Yeah. And our fans going for him and, and all that. And I couldn't see a way back and I couldn't see a way back with Cronkies in charge. And I just thought this club is just on a downward trajectory. I just felt we needed something you know and they were going to bring Arteta in originally weren't they before Emery 
wasn't right. Well, this is what I've heard. And and now the time was right. And you know what? And, and we'll go back to your book in a second. It is Arteta's arsenal. Mm, it is, yeah. I mean, it, in the book, it talks about that when they appointed Emery. And, you know, Mikel literally thought he had that job. He was he was telling he was he was putting a coaching staff together. He thought he was have, getting was going to be appointed in 24 hours. And then suddenly just a U-turn happened and Emery got it. And, you know, that was a big blow for Mikel. He really wanted it. He was determined to get that job at that point. But I do look back now and think that was probably the best thing that could have happened to him was actually missing out there. And, you know, you almost felt like you needed that manager in the middle of it all before the the success could come because it was so hard to replace Arsene, to replace someone who'd been there for so long and going in and trying to change that. You'd always have, there were Arsene's people at the training ground. Everywhere it was, it was, an, it was Arsene's people. And so for Mikel, I think it was probably better that he didn't get it then and waited another 18 months to get it because, you know, you know, he's excellent manager. He's showing that now at Villa. His record speaks for itself, but even he mm. found it so difficult to replace, to be the man who replaced Arsene Wenger. And, um, and so, yeah, I think for Mikel, it was actually probably a blessing in disguise that that decision was taken the way it was. I'll just say one last thing, Chris, and that's it. And I knew how good he was because my City mates did not want him to leave City, Charles. They were saying to me when it was all mooted that he was coming, what a manager he's going to be. I mean, these are, you know, City season ticket holders that adore Pep. And they said to me, he, he, awesome, awesome man, awesome coach. And I think that I often listen to rival fans about, different players managers coaches because you can be biased can't you at times but he did they didn't want him to leave yeah yeah no he's absolutely he's everywhere everywhere he's been he's been so respected and um uh, city 100 you know pep didn't want him to leave pep would have kept him 100 but yeah. you know he didn't stand in his way and you know, Mikel was determined to come back to arsenal when he when he left when he retired and like after that game against aston villa he said as he walked down the tunnel i'm coming back here to to manage one day he was determined it was his it was his dream. And so when Arsenal came knocking for that second time, he wasn't going to turn it down. I think Pep Guardiola reluctantly just accepted that and knew it was time for him to go. Yeah, it's really, really interesting, actually. You just referenced it a minute ago. You're talking about and also when you talked about the actual book, obviously it's charted around the time of Mikel Arteta, but it's actually more about the whole club and the way that the club has effectively changed. Mm. You know, we've had the Senyehi era, you know, we've had... Um, Edu now taking up a little bit more responsibility and controlling what Mertesacker and stuff like that. So can you just touch on that a little bit around the fact that, uh, you know, the book is called Arteta's Revolution, but uh, Revolution, Arte the Rise of Arteta, but actually the importance of the infrastructure that he's been able to build around him? Massively. I mean, it's, it's so central. It's not just Mikel. You know, Mikel deserves a lot of credit as his manager, but I think everyone has bought into this, the, the project. You know, Mikel's been central to it and he's had the vision that he wanted and he's so determined that it's going to go in that way but alongside him he's had everyone working to that same vision and and doing their job really really well you know edu deserves an awful lot of credit for the work he's done there's still some question marks about edu and i think we've seen that this summer in terms of his ability to sell players it's not you know it's a it's a question mark he can i just stop you there then just one second because there is a question that's very relevant to this um if i can just i'll find it two seconds oh so sorry hold on one second um because someone here we go um, from Carl Stark. Charles, who is responsible for selling our players and why are they so bad at getting a decent sum for them holding Pepe Leno? We seem to pay top dollar to buy players, selling not so. Yeah, well, I mean, not at the end of the day, Edu's in charge of selling. He's the sporting director. It's not, you know, the Cronkies and everyone will be involved in it. KSC will be involved in it and, you know, Tim Lewis and people like that. But Edu's the sporting director, so he's the guy going to be leading the negotiations with with the clubs and coming up with a fee that the club has agreed with. And, you know, it's not been great. I don't think this summer has been terrible by Arsenal standards. They've actually, I think the Granit Xhaka deal has helped them. I look at the, the the holding deal from my point of view is an absolute disaster. I don't understand that deal. It, unless, unless it is just a thank you to Rob Holding, I don't understand how you can sell a proven Premier League player at 27 years old with two years left on his deal to a Premier League club for £1 million. I mean, that's a loan fee to a championship club. It doesn't make any sense to me. Tottenham sold Davison Sanchez with less than a year left on his contract, same age, to Galatasaray for 13 million, like a, day, a few days later. And I just don't get that deal. It's a disaster of a deal, which Leno was as well. Um, but then they did some all right business. Granite Jacket, for example. I think the big hole was Kieran Tierney. When they started this summer, they had they thought they were going to get 25, 30 million pounds for Kieran Tierney. 
And had they got that, they would have brought in about 115 million this summer, which I think they would have been they were happy with. But that there's that big Kieran Tierney hole in the finances, I think. And that might have been, been kicked down the line. They might get it next summer. Hopefully they will get it if the market's stronger for him. But mm-hmm. some of the deals that it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't quite get it. I think they've made a rod for their own back Arsenal in previous years. Clubs know that they will cancel contracts. I mean, as much as, uh, why would anyone pay for Nicolas Pepe this summer? Every he, Clubs, even if there's, unlimited money swirling around in football which there is at the moment certainly with some clubs from some countries but why would you come knocking for Nicolas Pepe because you just weighed it out because you know that Arsenal will, will reach an agreement and cancel his contract at some point so why mm. would you bid any money for him it doesn't and it's just history suggests Arsenal will do this so they've made a rod for mm. their own back in that regard and I think it's going to take a couple of summers a good summers of selling players for them to get that sort of tag off their back and they haven't been able to do it this summer. Yeah. Pepe was slightly different because of his wages. Look, this was, he's one of the last remaining players from that era when contracts were given out. You know, Cedric's probably the last as well now with, with Pepe gone, where Arsenal have made it difficult to sell players with the money they've put them on. Um, I think they're in a slightly better position now. And from this summer onwards, it should get, it should get better. Um, but yeah, there's certainly questions still to be answered, I think, by Edu when it comes to, when it comes to selling. They've got to get better at it. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question around the Kieran Tierney stuff? Um, do you think that the reason, do you think that because of the fact it's a loan deal, do you think essentially clubs have just looked at the Kieran Tierney situation and thought, well, in a year's time, let's let's get a loan deal because in a year's time we can just drive down the price. And actually that's then going to perpetuate this kind of perception that Arsenal are just going to sell him on the cheap. Do you think, I'm asking you guys to project forward to next summer. Let's just say Kieran Tinney's had a fantastic season at Sociedad. Do you think we're going to have the same problems, i.e. no one's going to come in for him or that we'll be low-balled on fee? I don't think so. I think they're in a slightly stronger position with Tierney than in most because he's still going to have two years left on his deal next summer. It's not like he's going to get down to the final 12 months. And there just wasn't a market for Tierney this summer. And it surprised me. I mean, Arsenal didn't get any decent bids for Tierney this summer. They were expecting them and they were would have welcomed them, but they just didn't arrive. We were all expecting Newcastle to bid. We started the summer convinced of it. Arsenal were convinced of it, but they just didn't. They just changed tune. And the reason, you know, Arsenal waited and waited and waited. And once Newcastle suddenly changed and went for Lewis Hall, you know, Arsenal were like, oh, so what are we going to do now? And the Sociedad was the next best bid on the table. I mean, Sociedad at least are paying all of his wages, which is, you know, mm. so it's going to save Arsenal a lot this summer. And I think if he goes there and stays injury free, which with Kieran, you always have to keep your fingers crossed. But if he does, I think he'll have a very good season over there. I think he'll do really well. And I think the market for Tierney next summer will be strong, probably stronger than it would have been this summer. And he'll still have two years left on the deal. So I think Arsenal is still in a strong position with Tierney. I can still easily envisage him getting good money for him next summer. It's just, for whatever reason, the move that we were all expecting, which was Newcastle, they decided to go down a different route. And I think everyone left, was left pretty surprised by that. And they had to then look at what was next best on the table. Yeah. Go on, Amanda. Okay. I was just going to do a couple of questions, really, because, you know, Charles has got to go soon. So... Karen Russell said, how did it all start for Charles from the beginning? Oh, what, in terms of Arsenal or yeah. journalism? Um, Both, probably. Or journalism, it all started 20-odd years ago at the Slough Windsor Express as a junior news reporter. <laughs> I did that for a good few years, sitting in parish council meetings, seeing, listening to people argue about fence posts and <laughs> being put up two <laughs> metres away from where they should have been, and me sitting there thinking, what on earth am I doing this for? one pound 50 an hour um but the vision was always to become a sports reporter everyone said you should do news first for a few years learn how to you know build stories and all that sort of stuff so i did that when carried on sort of passed my senior exams moved over to reading where i became a sports reporter for the first time started doing that for the reading evening post and moved around to a few bits sort of local papers and then um the arsenal job came up at football london when football london was launching and I was offered the opportunity to do that. And look, Arsenal was always my passion. It was always why I got into the industry on my first day of my ju- first journalism course as like a 20 year old. It was, I had to stand at the front of the class and say why I wanted to become a journalist. And I said, because I want to get paid to watch Arsenal. And <laughs> it, was, it was always my, always my ambition, always my dream. And so when, yeah, that came along in 2017 with Football London, it was obviously something I jumped at. And then it's just moved on from there. In terms of where, my Arsenal story began. It's uh, I'm sitting in my dad's house right now. It's his shirt behind me. 
and he grew up in on Hornsey Road. You know, he's born and bred Arsenal, and so yeah, I was an Arsenal fan. So first started going in '89, which was a good season to start, and it was season to get older in '91, and we've been season to get older ever since from Highbury to the Emirates, and still there now. And although I've been had been in the press box since 2017, I've kept my ticket. Was back in it on Sunday for the first time in ages for the Man United game to experience uh, everything that I missed last season sitting in the press box and a, a lot of fun it was. Can I ask a quick question on that one? Um, mm. What's for those of us who are either season ticket holders or just watch it on TV? What's the difference? The experience through as a journalist going through that versus you know. I'm going there to watch Arsenal for fun, although it's only fun when obviously we absolutely batter teams because it can be painful at times. But Yeah, I mean, it's completely different. Uh, obviously, because you, you're focusing on what you're doing on the screen all the time. You know, I'm writing and you can't get completely absorbed in the match and it, it's, it is completely different. And that's a big reason why at the end of last season, I've decided to go down a different route than I have in my career and sort of move on from what I was doing for goal and go and sort of tread my own path because I missed it so much last season and I wanted to be involved in it. And, you know, I, when Reese Nelson scored against Bournemouth, for example, it was first, first and only time I totally lost my professionalism in the press <laughs> box and it was on my What did team. you do? What did you do? <laughs> it was, I was right behind it as well. So as soon as he hit it, I could see it was going in from where I was in the press oh box my God. and I just totally lost it. And it was the only time I've really ever done that and just lost my court. That and when... Nacho scored the equaliser against Man City in the semi-final in 2017. Yeah. Again, when I was in the press box at Wembley in the Man City end as well, where the press box was. And it was so unexpected, that goal. I was convinced they'd won after they went 1-0 up. And then to suddenly, yeah, I lost it at that point as well. Um, and so it's really hard. You've got to, you're, you're writing, you've got deadlines that you've got to hit on the whistle. So it's, and a lot of the time you're not even looking at the match because you're writing so much and you have to keep looking up when you hear the crowd roar and stuff. And having done that every game home and away since 2017 it was just I was really missing it and my dad's like 78 now and I'm very aware of that and I wanted to get back to sitting with him my son's seven and getting to the age where I want to start taking him to Arsenal and if I'm in the press box I can't do that and I, you know I've got so many special memories of being with my dad for the first times at Highbury when I was seven eight years old and the thought of not being able to do that with my son has been kind of weighing on my mind a lot as he's been getting older and so that's all sort of tied into it. And I'll see you like in a, a year's time, maybe I'll go back and be doing it again in a, and go back to it. But for now, I'm just, I can't wait for this season of being in my own seat and enjoying everything. Hopefully a little bit drama, as less drama than we saw last weekend yeah. in a way. I'm not sure my heart, I got, I got an alert on my phone that my, from an abnormal heart rate, even though I appeared to be sitting <laughs> down. <laughs> and I was like, I was looking at it. I got it like two days later and I was looking at it. I was like, what, what was I doing on Sunday at 6.30 sitting down? I had an abnormal heart rate. And then I, cl I clocked it was when I was at the Emirates and it was at the end of the game. <laughs> it just makes yeah. it worse, doesn't it, Charles, as well? You get abnormal heart rate because... You're going, Matt, and then you've got VAR, then you've got all that stress to deal with. And it is, it's just the game has changed so much. And you mentioned that you went with your dad, and that's obviously what I did um, at Highbury. But many years before you, you are a lot younger than me. Um, but what, you know, what made you want to write this book? Because... I can't wait to read it. You've had great reviews. You're on the Sunday's bestseller list. Sunday Times bestseller, yeah. Today it's in Fantastic. the it's a, quite an amazing thing. I wasn't expecting that when I when I started all this. So yeah, that was a very exciting when I heard the news. It that. shows that you are really respected through the Arsenal community. Um, you know what it's like. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's on whoever's in the media to do with Arsenal, but you are very well respected. So tell us about the book from start to finish. Did you enjoy it? Or did you see it as a job? Oh, no, I enjoyed it. Certainly, it was tough because I was doing it on top of my job. And it was obviously we started it in about, I think the, I was approached by the publishers about it in sort of February time. And I took a couple of weeks to decide. I had to weigh it up. I was obviously doing my job. I had suddenly, it's like, I've never done a book before. I'd never, so I'd never knew what, it, I didn't really know what to expect. It was suddenly I was going to have to write 75,000 words in pretty short space of time on top of, covering Arsenal for goal when they're in the middle of a title race on top of raising two young kids who I've struggled to see at times anyway because of being yeah. a football reporter is not easy you're on the road a lot um and but I sort of weighed it all up and it'd been an ambition of mine forever to do a book you know I, I always thought I'd love to do that it'd be such a great thing to do and especially to do one in Arsenal so although I did think about it for two weeks I, I, I knew pretty much straight away I was going to say yes um even though I knew it's going to be quite a 
a, a big task and I, and I did I did enjoy it, it was difficult <laughs> don't get me wrong at times I was thinking what the hell have I done here um but I did enjoy it but I, I, I was speaking about this to someone the other day I did a half marathon a few years ago and I distinctly remember when I finished I crossed the finish line it was at the Medeski Stadium it actually I crossed the finish line at Reading's football stadium and I distinctly remember thinking oh, I, I'm never doing that again when I crossed the finish line and when I finished the book <laughs> I, it was the same sort of feeling when I sort of wrote the last word, pressed the full stop, sort of sat back. And I was in Maidenhead Library at the time because I'd got writer's block for the first time right at the end of it. I think because I could see the finish line, I suddenly, I, I'd lost my head and I sort of had you to go. excited. To, you know, I had to go to different places to try and clear that writer's block. And I was, I was sitting in random places in my in my around where I live. And I ended up in the library and I remember finishing and just sitting back and looking at it and just thinking, yeah, I'm not doing that again. But now I had now I it, that was a while ago, and I've seen the obviously this is I've seen this, and I, I I would do it again. I definitely would do it again. But um, it was it was a lot of fun. It was very stressful, but it was a lot of fun. Can I can I ask a question in relation to that then? So, um, because I listened to um, Ask Blog's uh, pod you did with him, and you talked about that a couple of those examples, uh, and you know, do I write? I'd write another book. Um, if we're in five years' time, if you're doing. Arteta's Revolution 2.0. Um, mm. What does that kind of look like? What's the utopia there? And uh, what do you think the journey might be, will be? God, that, I mean, that's hard. I know that's why I, I asked I it. Don't, I don't, <laughs> that's why I'm really interested about what happens next with Arsenal under Mikel, because, you know, everyone keeps saying to me, what's your expectations for this season? And it's really hard to answer that because the expectations, obviously, we didn't really have them in the last couple of years, but this year we do have the expectation. But on top of that, you've got it's you're still going against Manchester City. Like I don't look if Arsenal finish second this season in the Premier League and the Man City win it, it's not a failure. You know, everyone says like, you have to win the league. That's just rubbish. You you can't just say that. It cannot be you have to win the league. That can't be the expectation because it's just totally unrealistic. You've got you know we'd all want them to challenge again. I hope they do and they should do. I think they've got the squad to do it and they've got the manager to do it and the players to do it. But ultimately, if they fall short, I don't think that's a failure by any means. It's just you're up against the best team in the world with what you have to say is probably the best manager in the world who, again, have spent a lot of money in the summer to, to strengthen. So it's going to be really, really difficult. And you've got other teams who have strengthened as well. So um, it's it's tough. I would love to see them really compete in the Champions League. I think for Arsenal, that's, that's what the next few years mm. needs to be about to show they're not just good, a top Premier League team again, but they're a top european team again and i look at the champions league this season and i don't think there's that much to fear other than manchester city i don't i think anyone in that if arsenal meet any of those teams they can go toe to toe with them but they've got to prove it and one question mark over Mikel is his ability to do it in europe so far he struggled in europe he struggled in the europa league he struggled in knockout games and he's got to show this season i think that he can take this team deep into europe because they've got the quality the squads there the capabilities there and I think that's a big question mark over Mikel. And if he can do that and Arsenal can continue to move forward in the way they have, then, you know, I, I, I don't I don't see where the limit is for them over the next few years. I think they've got the squad. They've got young players. They're improving all the time. They've got a fan base behind them. And so they, I think they can achieve an awful lot. But there is just that giant mammoth shadow that is Manchester City lurking over it all. Yeah. And the 115 Premier League charges floating over them which you know we wait to see how that is resolved but you know that's what Arsenal are up against um we've got a couple of questions um I don't know that you've said this so let's put it up there um Phil said I'd be interested to hear Amanda and Chris's views on Charles comments on Raya, Raya becoming number one very soon did you say that do you think that's what's going to happen I didn't say very soon. I said by the end of the season, I'll be surprised. For Raya. I think I think Raya will be number one by the end of the season. I don't I don't think it will happen necessarily very soon. But I'd, if if Aaron I, if if Aaron is still number one, I'd be I'd be shocked. But we're not shocked. That's the wrong word. I'd be surprised. I just think I can't imagine Raya would have come here to sit on the bench all season for me. No. I, think, I think he ends up number one. But I why? Think right. Why do you think we've needed him? I don't see anything wrong with Ramsdale. I don't, but. I wonder if the coaching staff and the analysts perhaps do. But um, I think Aaron's done great. I think his character is brilliant. His personality is brilliant. I don't think he's let the team down by any means. But, you know, Mikel is a very, very ruthless person. He's all about winning. He's all about 
improving and if you know i think they would have sat down this summer saying where can we improve this team how what are the small margins we can improve on to make us go that next step to actually get past this unbelievable manchester city team and i just wonder if goalkeeper was one of those positions that that he looked at and identified as potentially being that area Mm. I know- have a slight, can I just, sorry, on Ramsdale, I know like everyone disagrees with me, but I'm wondering if it's because his wife is due to give birth and maybe they've agreed certain times off. I don't know, because it's not somewhere I would have looked at, Charles, to say that that's, I was shocked, to be honest. But anyway, go on, Chris. Well, I was just going to say, um, I think Charles is right on the, you know, any sort of marginal gains that Arteta can do to compete and anything he can do, I think he will do it. And a really good example of that is when we fir- when he first arrived, Kieran Tierney was like one of the guys that he absolutely loved. Mm. And he decided at some point, I suspect, and Charles, I'll be interested to get your view. My gut feel is that because of Tierney's injury record, but also because Arteta ultimately decided I need to play a different way, he just he was just ruthless. And I think it's it, you could see the same sort of situation with Raya and uh, with uh, Ramsdale. But I tell you what, as well, if Gabriel Jesus, because I've had a few people that have suggested that maybe we could upgrade on Gabriel Jesus. And I know, Charles, you said in the summer that that was one of your guys to, to bang. Um, I think he has to. Or I could see that centre forward be, position being somewhere where Arteta says, "All right, maybe I need my version of Erling Haaland." Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I think Arsenal will sign a centre forward next summer, um, and I think that probably would be an area that they look at if if Jesus doesn't maybe hit that twenty goal mark or you know consistently score throughout the season. Um, he is ruthless like that. The Tierney example is a great example. You know, we, two years ago Tierney was one of the first names on the team sheet. He was so important for Arsenal, not just defensively but going forward as well, and. When he was out, it was seen as an absolute disaster. But, you know, the team evolves very, very quickly under Mikel. He makes these changes very, very quickly and he changes his thinking very quickly. And, um, you know, we, we thought he was going to be Arsenal captain, didn't we, Kieran Tierney, uh, at one mm-hmm. point. And now he's he, he's out the door. And so, yeah, I don't think anyone's safe in this Arsenal team. You can be, you can, you know, actually, it's probably not true. There's probably a couple of people that are safe in this Arsenal team because Isaac is one of them. But yeah. other than that, um, you know, I think everyone's position is up for is up for grabs and that's what Mikel wants he wants everyone to be on their toes and you know if Ram- if Ramsdale plays out of his skin between now and the end of the season then he'll keep his place he is number one at the moment and he deserves to be number one at the moment um and if he can absolutely raise his game and produce brilliant performances I think you know he'll stay he won't give it Mikel any reason to drop him but I just wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if if that change happens at some point before May put it that way I'm really conscious of time, Charles, and we've got some brilliant questions. So are you able to come back on in the next couple of months and talk to everybody? Because everyone's really enjoying the show, but we know you've got to go. I've just got okay. one quick question. I think we'll all want to know this. Um, Charles, what's going on with Gabrielle's injury? Please tell me that he's not in, He's not going to be out injured. Is there something going on there? Is that why he's been held back? No, game. I don't think so. I think it's a fresh. This is a fresh injury. I don't know what what it is. Obviously, still away from Brazil at the moment, so I, I haven't heard in terms of what the extent is. Fingers crossed, it's not too bad. It seemed like the word coming out of Brazil that it wasn't overly serious. So you know, fingers oh. crossed that that'd be awful if he came back injured. Just got back into the team. We we're all desperate for him to come back in the team. Where we yeah. came back, got next to Saliba, looked a million dollars in that game against United. Um, and the last thing he'd want and up and we'd want was for him to come back from international duty with an injury. So fingers crossed he, he doesn't. But it doesn't seem like anyway, coming out the news coming out of Brazil that it's anything anything too serious, fingers crossed. Fabulous. Um okay. One, got one more, Amanda. I've got, I've got loads more. more. I've got loads more. <laughs> I am, I am honestly I can come back I can come back on though plenty of time. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, Thank don't worry you. About that. Robert Stevens says, Do you believe Arteta has shown he's a top class manager by how he handled the Abamian situation as well? Yeah. And again, that was just that's a perfect example of the ruthless side of Mikel Arteta. This is a player who was absolutely central to his plans, who he campaigned to give a huge contract to, you know, and had basically done all the talks himself during COVID and was, you know, convinced of Bamiang to stay. You know, he was his guy. And then within, what, 18 months, he was out the door and his mm. contract was paid up. And that was, again, it's just another prime example of the ruthless side to Mikel and, um, and that no one, and there's an example that no one, no one is safe under him. And if you don't, 
if you don't perform or if you don't abide to the way he the sort of demands that he sets from his players in terms of how they how they behave away from away from the pitch then then you'll be gone and everyone knows that and so I think he handled that situation really really well and um you know it was difficult you kind of look at it and think this is a top goal scorer not, not in the team and it was at a time when Arsenal needed to score goals as well yeah but he still took the decision mm. I think um yeah I think he certainly showed I remember that scene in uh all or nothing when El Nenny and Holden are sitting in the in the cafeteria, aren't they talking about that situation? And Mo's like, "Oh, the boss has got balls, isn't he?" And Holden's like, "Yeah, he has got balls." And it was just, it just, it just showed the whole squad and the whole changing room that it doesn't matter if you're the captain, it doesn't matter if you matter if you're the top earning player in the team. If you don't, if you don't set live up to the standards that he demands, then you're then you're going to be out of the team, and ultimately you're going to be gone. And uh, so I think he did he did handle that situation very very well. And it's tough to look at it now and think it wasn't the right decision, is it? Mm. From Arsenal's point of view and from where Aubameyang's career has gone since then as well. Yeah, I mean, rip, it was like ripping off the band aid, wasn't it? Like we were all felt like we were sort of des- we were reliant on Obama, and I did as well. But ultimately, um, he needed to go. Um, and and speaking of needing to go, you've got uh, other prior engagements. Uh, Charles is here, there, and everywhere on all kinds of TV shows and podcasts. So uh, we're going to let him go. But Charles, amazing to have you on, mate. We'll get you. Uh, we'll get you on again, probably a post gamer where we can all uh, wax lyrical about how Arsenal have beaten uh, maybe beaten Tottenham or an Everton or a Liverpool, uh, something like that. So yeah, it would certainly be nice to beat an Everton because I'm fed up with losing to them oh. against the Spark. So oh, okay. <laughs> hopefully we can actually go there and win off the international break for the what? first. Just before you go, what's your prediction? Oh, Amanda, I don't do it. I'm so superstitious. You would not believe. And then that's fine. I'll leave you be. You freak me out so much. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. If I say Arsenal are going to win, we lose. So I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to. Fair oh. enough. Fair enough. We'll let you go, Charles. Thank you very much for joining us once again. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Brilliant. Cheers, man. Thank you, Charles. Bye-bye. Take care. Later. And that was Charles Watts. Uh, absolutely amazing talking to him. Uh, obviously, um, Check out his book. I mean, it's everywhere. So um, if yeah. you uh, if you want to l- l- watch it, download it, read it, I'm sure. I wonder if it'll do an audio book version, Amanda. I hope so. I'd love that. Honestly, I really do. I'm, I think that book is going to be really interesting. Charles was just brilliant. And as he said, and we'll hold him to that, he will come back on because 40 minutes has just gone like that. I can't mm. believe it. We've got so many brilliant questions. I'm so sorry to everyone. We did star them all. But unfortunately, it was too short. Next time we'll get him for the full hour, won't we, Chris? We will. Certainly we will. So um, I want to talk about a couple of bits before we then, uh, we then clock off today. Um, uh, again, just a bit of a shorter one than normal, obviously not a post-match one, but uh, hopefully it's given you your Arsenal sort of injection for the week, the injection of adrenaline. The two things I want to talk about, get your views of, Amanda. Number one is the Nico Pepe. How happy are you just give me a minute or two thoughts on that and then the second thing I want to talk about is Erdogan but start with Pepe okay so I really rated Pepe when he came you know what I'm like I'm always miss positive aren't I um there must have been something that 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 didn't work for him I don't know why I think he had talent I think he was one of these I know it sounds really weird because it's obvious he's either going to make it or he's not I thought he was going to make it and I remember being chatting with Kevin Campbell about this and we both saw so much good in what he was bringing but it wasn't consistent enough something's obviously going on because no managers played him consistent enough so good luck to him you know he's never I've I've not seen him slag us off so good luck to him at Trabzon Sport, which is funny enough, Kev's old um, team. Um, and yeah, fair enough. I, and also, it was interesting. I wanted to come back to Charles on holding because I sort of disagree. They obviously did have some agreement with him. And the fact that he's been such a great servant. And as I said before, and I've said it time and time again, a player's only worth what someone's prepared to pay for him. And if you've got that agreement or you want his wages off the books, then that's that. But I've said that before. I, anyway. See, I don't. I think that I know every single team seems to be able to sell players. I mean, Chelsea's ridiculous. They get rid of dross that, you know, are just not even succeeding and they seem to be able to do it. And Rob Holding is not a – this guy isn't from League Two a League Two centre-half that's a cloggermeister. I, I, I've never really rated Holding, but no. he's a Premier League defender with Premier League experience. We should have got more than a million pounds. But anyway, um, the Nico Pepe stuff, yeah, just a bit sad, really, because um, I just thought look, that guy, some of his finishing was amazing, but he just seems like quite an introverted, insular character. And it just, 
I don't know, it seemed quite early on that it was never going to work, but we all just were so desperate. And unfortunately, yeah. the millstone around his neck was that £72 million yeah. uh, transfer fee. But there we go. Let's talk about Odegaard. Um, Fabrizio Romano today, earlier on, posted, I, th I think he was on a podcast or something or other, he actually said something like, you know, Odegaard's in love with <clears> Arsenal, <throat> Arsenal are in love with Odegaard, they're trying to sort out a new contract, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, this this uh, platform, this same old Arsenal podcast, I basically use as my cheerleading for Martin Erdegaard platform because, you know, I love that guy. I think he's amazing. I think his vision, I think his touch, I think his passing range. I think he's an absolutely perfect captain for us. Um, he even does good captain's notes in the uh, in the in the program, which, again, Aubameyang didn't even bother doing it, did he? So, uh I wanted to get your thoughts on hearing that. And my next, my main question for you is, do you think in five, six years' time, we'll be talking about Odegaard as a legend of Arsenal? Yes, I do. And I love Erdegaard as much as you do. And I'm so pleased that all of us on here love Erdegaard and can see what he brings. Um, I fought his corner everywhere with everyone that didn't um with Erdegaard because he came to us on loan didn't he and then we re-signed him and people are like oh no what have we re-signed him for the thing is I think because I trust Arteta that I think that if he's good if, if Arteta thinks he's good enough then he's good enough for me um and I liked what Erdegaard brought to us and I do I agree with you about his vision and look what he did against United I mean honestly before he even touched that ball I knew it was in um do I think he's already a legend like Melissa's saying? No, not yet. No, no, no. He's not a legend yet. But he's growing. Arsenal are growing. And we're all growing together. And I think he's just magnificent. And I think I think he's... Oh God, how do I put this? You know, we could go on and on about how great he is. And I remember um, having this podcast with Alan Algar on. I didn't stop. We don't stop arguing, me and Alan, about this. He says he doesn't make does, do it in the big matches. Well, Mr Algar. He did, didn't he, against United? Um, I think it's really interesting on the captain side because we can see a young Declan Rice coming through to that as well. Um, and I don't mind having two um, superb captains on the pitch, if I'm honest. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a supposing that Declan will be made vice captain not long. It's just He's just so captain material. But I'm chuffed that, you know, he's in love with us as much as we're in love with him. Mm. You're absolutely right. Do you know what as well? So many years we've had captains where you like Fiera and Fabregas and basically I almost try and protect myself by mm. not fully investing in them because I always think oh, they're going to go off to a Real Madrid or a Barcelona or whatever it is. I genuinely feel like Erdegaard's a sort of player that feels like he found, he's found his home and he could happily stay at the club until he's into his 30s and really establish himself so yeah i i love the guy and he's he's absolutely brilliant um i don't know if you're seeing the comments though but a lot of people are saying that he's already a legend is reminding them of dennis burkamp i mean Big shoes not, to fill. yeah i'm not at that stage yet gooners but if he reminds you yeah that's fantastic i mean burkamp was just he was Whatever. he was a magical he was an absolutely magical footballer um that was the two main things i wanted to get is there anything on your mind before we uh clock off for today yep just to mention thank you to everybody that watches the show listens on audio if you could press like you've got to like this show i mean charles watts was superb so on the way out um if you love the show please press like um please on audio if you could rate us and review us as I say every week apparently it means a lot I don't really know um I want to mention about the fact that Cookie will be back this week because we've all been a bit bored haven't we? I mean this heat's done my head in there's no football god forbid Gabrielle's injured these interdolls do my head in um but we're back next um Sunday afternoon Everton away um Chris uh sorry Cookie will be doing a review show Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Please look out for that. If you don't want to look out for it, just subscribe. It's free and you'll get alerts from us. I'm away next weekend, so I'll be in Bournemouth watching us play Everton with my other half. Um, my son's going to uni, so I'll be down there putting him in uni and then getting down some sort of pub. So if anyone's from Bournemouth, can they let me know where we should go and watch the game? That'd be brilliant. Um, also, our little announcement that we made this week, 
young Christopher, about the fabulous Ruth Beck art. She's mm. going to be showcased on all of our pods coming up very shortly. And if you don't know who she is, she is the most fantastic artist of Arsenal I've ever seen. Yeah. And I love all her work. And I've got loads of things behind me on those shelves that I've got from her. So Ruth's going to be joining us. Um, I'm trying to get us get her to come on the podcast. But if you don't know who she is, Ruth Beck Art, go and um, follow her. She's going to be part of us. And we just really need to take Everton predictions now, don't we, Chris? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, I hate Everton. Do you know what I, I hate about Everton, Why? right? Is they're rubbish. And they've been rubbish for ages. And yet they always seem to be able to just skank something against us, which is why. Do you know, actually, this time, though, I'm, 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 you know what I'm like? I'm super pessimistic most of the time. Uh, I actually think we're going to win. I think we're going to win 2 0. I think we're going to shut them out. And I hope we're going to shut Sean Dyche up because I feel like every time we play a Sean Dyche team, he has an excuse of some kind uh, as to why um, a clearly better Arsenal team beat his own team. So I'm hoping for a nice 2 0. I'm hoping for a, a game which uh, we assert our dominance and that Everton uh, don't get anywhere. And uh, in order for that to happen, I feel like we just have to not concede any corners or free kicks because it only, it feels like the last three or four times we've gone up to Goodison, they get one corner yeah. or one free kick or one wonder goal and that's it. But yeah, 2 0 Arsenal. Come on. What's everyone saying? Because I'm going, so you've gone 2 0, I've gone 1 all, unfortunately. I just think it's just going to continue this. This bloody bogey side. Um, they, I don't know what it is about Goodison Park, but their fans are, you know, closer to the pitch than a lot of stadiums. They've still got their old stadium. Their new one's being built currently. Um, I actually might be on Toffee TV this week. I don't know if anyone follows them, but um, I might do something with Baza, who's a friend of mine as well. Um, and I, I actually predicted it correct last time, and so did he. He thought they were going to win, and I said they were going to win. They needed to win to stay up. Maybe we're playing them at a good time, but I'm going one all. We'll find out what Cookie's going to um, predict when he does his review show. But apart from that, Christopher, I think that unless anyone's got anything, maybe people want to ask us questions. If anyone wants to ask us questions in the last minute, please do, because we don't normally get a chance to do this. Totally up to you lot, whatever you want to do. But hopefully um, Gabrielle's fit. Hopefully we have the same team out. Um, <laughs> I'm just not optimistic at Goodison Park. I'm really, really not. I'm not. I'm sorry, I'm not. Um, it's just the one ground. It's upsetting. Um, yeah, so that's it really, Chris. Unless you've got any other business and anyone wants to... Uh, <laughs> so Newman, stop it with my toothpaste. This is an Arsenal show, you nutter. I think on um, that point, I think on that point, we probably should wrap it up for the day and say we're going to really enjoy if it. The uh, questions are going to come like that. We are yeah. wrapping it up now. <laughs> yeah, um, really, really good to chat to Charles. Great yeah. to talk to you as always, Amanda. And yeah, and yeah. Um, take us home because uh, so uh, le letting you in behind the curtain a little bit here, listener. Amanda and I have this rule: one person hosts and one person does the admin. And uh, sometimes you'll see the uh, comments come up and come down too quickly. It's because Amanda and I are too are being too eager and we're both having a go. So I'm just going to stop now say thank you very much and let her finish off the show there you go admin crack it on <laughs> oh i'm admin i love it i'm admin tonight um thanks chris brilliantly hosted we need charles on again thank god he said he would guys everyone um the good news is the heat is stopping tomorrow night that's all i'm so excited i am so excited because as you can see my lovely shine um keep well up the arsenal and all that and as i always always say always arsenal <laughs>